there is something about the internet that isn't working anymore. And maybe hasn't worked for a long time and maybe it never worked the way I thought it did. I grew up with the internet very much evolving with me socially. And it's only been more recently that I feel like the ideas and control of the internet have drastically changed. And there's this awareness of, of who you are online can be found out and impact your real life. A lot of people see the internet as like the last free frontier. But that's totally not true. We're so dependent on corporate infrastructure at this point. Infrastructure is something that's sort of designed to be ignored and it's something that people tend to only notice when it's not working. And in some very literal physical ways and in other kind of more abstract ways, there is something about the internet as it is right now that is not working. This week, I would really like to try and figure out <laughs> what that thing is and maybe figure out what to do about it. And I, I feel like this is a group of, of people who might be able to help do that. Addie Wagonect first contacted me a few months ago with a mission statement she was developing for an all-female collective of artists, hackers, journalists, and theorists, people who are specializing in digital art and culture. Deep Lab came together for a week-long residency in Pittsburgh in early December of 2014. And so that was really, I guess, the thesis that I was playing with was how do we bring women together who are already doing really amazing things and kind of push them and give them the faith of like putting those thoughts out there. I've never been around that many women who program. Anybody who knows how to code will look at a situation that involves code and they'll see more dimension to the problem. I definitely think technology and data are weapons. So it's like, how do you control what's invisible, right? We're all about kind of using technology to subvert power in ways that people don't normally think of it being subvertible. These are all women that I think Addie identifies with on some core level and also felt a really strong desire to bring together in a collaborative environment so that we could form a sort of team that would be stronger together than we could be on our own. It's just really fun hanging out with badass smart women. The deep web is the unindexed part of the internet. There are um, certain protocols that let you have hidden service websites where you can only access them through things like Tor. There's no way of sort of knowing uh, who owns the server you're accessing, and in return, the server doesn't know who you are either. So things like Silk Road um, and like a lot of awful like black market websites are sort of now on the deep web. So Google crawls the internet with all these bots and sort of 
indexes all their sites, um, all the sites sort of on the internet, but there are certain sites that are currently unindexed, and it's actually the majority of the web, I think. Uh, if you imagine an iceberg, it's the, the visible web that we can search for on like Google or like Bing or whatever is sort of that tip, and then there's this giant mass underneath that's the deep web. So when I was in middle school, I was obsessed with reading like hacker manifestos, I guess. And I was like, oh, I want to be a hacker. I want to be a hacker. But uh, I never learned how to code until I was like almost graduated from high school. I think part of that was because it was really inaccessible to me as I guess a 13 year old girl <laughs> to like be able to start programming. And I think it's still it's still a little intimidating in some ways, but I think now I have more confidence. I worked as a journalist and I saw where the world is going and it's going towards technology. So if I wanted to have more agency in the world, these are things I needed to learn. And that doesn't mean that I, this is where I want the world to go, but I want to have power to move within it. And so if the river is all flowing one way, I'm not gonna be able to hold back that river, but learning some tech skills and being able to navigate my way for me means that I'm not relying on all of Silicon Valley to tell me how to live my life. And you know, Facebook is the biggest internet service today in terms of the number of people who use it. And we feel like we have the social responsibility to help spread the internet and all the goodness that, that comes along with that. And it's possible to connect a billion people today because there are a billion people in the world who have the internet. I'm starting to realize how dependent I am on all of these sort of corporations to send unaltered information to other people and also to store and sort of use my data, which is actually, I mean, that's, and that's starting to scare me more and more as I'm starting to realize, um, especially like how, how much of this data is accessible to everyone. Surveillance grows out of hand because people are, are ignorant of the repercussions of giving away such power to other people. If people feel like they're being watched all the time, they don't feel free to say what they want to say, do what they want to do, and associate with the people they want to associate with. And so privacy uh, has become kind of a fundamental right that um, we need to have in order to feel and be free. I'm screwed. You know, everybody in my generation is screwed because we've been dumping like so many, I guess, selfies and like Facebook statuses and all of this information. And it's culturally normalized at this point. So, you know, if I'm not on Facebook or I'm not on Instagram or whatever, I'm a Luddite and I'm seen as like crazy. But if I post all, you know, if I, if I do choose to participate in sort of these uh, corporate structures or whatever, then I'm losing sort of the ability to protect my data and to protect my information, which also is awful. And then people, um, you know, reprimand me for that too. <laughs> so it's a, it's a catch-22 situation where I have to either choose whether or not I want to be culturally relevant and sort of adhere to social norms and be invited to Facebook events, or if I want to be safe and sort of protect my information. And I'm sure that the corporations that run the social media sites, they can sort of recognize my face or they can analyze the way I write or even the way I, you know, scroll down on their website. Automatically, by the fact that you're browsing the web, you're leaving a lot of information about who you are, which websites you're visiting, what you like and what you don't like. By just using the internet, you are opting in to giving out all of this information about yourself. 
the same methods of control and surveillance that the government uses that we're so afraid of, they didn't come up with those ideas themselves. Those are ideas that they cribbed from companies like Google. Those are ideas that they cribbed from advertising companies that do nothing but gather our data in order to push more products upon us. And we're dumping all of this information into giant server farms in like the middle of nowhere run by the government. And they're definitely like spying on, on people who are maybe perceived to be threats. But I think that we don't actually know what the criteria is for that. From reports I've read, you can like write an email in another language and that sets up a red flag. But in some other cases, it doesn't. Initially, I had been interested in general in sort of like the superstructures of surveillance because I, I was sort of disappointed with the way that people were both talking about and visualizing and illustrating what what they thought surveillance was or meant. Um, and a lot of the emphasis was more on like the state, right? And on the agencies. And I started looking more at where do these interceptions take place? Or like where where is the data that is being taken anyway? Like when people say like, they took your like email metadata, they took, it's like, well, where was it? It's not, it wasn't really on my phone. It wasn't really in my browser. It's not as though they like snuck in and like just put a thumb drive. It's like, it had to be somewhere. And so that got me thinking a lot about trying to understand like data center geography. Doors opened and closed, and they were in the analytical wing. Ahead of them rose impressive banks of equipment. The data receptors and the computing mechanisms that studied and restructured the incoming material. So it went from cutting communication to intercepting communication to targeting communication to intercept to this huge, multi-targeted, vast, sucking maw of data that is enabled by a global internet. It's definitely digital warfare. The presumed identity of anyone on the internet is, you know, a straight white male. And anyone who shows themselves on the internet or, or otherwise not to conform to that identity is put through a lot of scrutiny and a lot of criticism. I mean, really for no reason. <laughs> When we try to protect ourselves, we offer up solutions that anyone can pick up to protect themselves. 
it seems to be that once one person starts trolling you, um, that more and more people start getting on your back, sending you angry tweets and direct messages and emails. And waking up to like this inbox of hate can really emotionally drain you to either want to escape or just quit. And I think that's another thing like with Deep Lab that's been interesting to me is being able to bounce that off other women and just talk about like how you deal with abuse, who do you approach, like how do you get a reaction or elicit a response from someone that will help you. Think about the information that you have and the information that you've worked with over the past, past week, past three days. And then think about how you would feel if all of this information was published on a Tumblr tomorrow. A journalist had gone to Iran to interview a bunch of activists about the work that they do there and had interviewed a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and gotten more names of people that he should talk to. And then he was stopped on the border going home and suddenly every single person that he talked to was at risk. Iranian protesters with you know, mobile phones and cameras, they, they just, they started to become citizen journalists. This is Neda, one of the countless civilians who got shot and killed during the protests in Iran. The authorities never actually switched off the internet entirely because they wanted to track down the people who upload these kind of videos. I have also spent some time creating a list of journalists that have been arrested in Ferguson while covering the protests there. What's been a little bit scary is watching all of that unfold and realizing like there are people in America who are still negotiating for their survival and, and the rules for their survival and realizing that it's not an exclusively non-Western problem, but it's happening in Western places. And I think that's why a lot of people are protesting as well, is realizing that the value of a person's life is still negotiable. How do we live in this in-between period of being wholehearted and open and yet fighting this fight against this tremendous injustice in the world? Yeah, that's where I'm trying to be. I don't think we're ever going to get to utopia again by going forward, but only roundabout or sideways, because we're in a rational dilemma, an either-or situation as perceived by the binary computer mentality, and neither the either nor the or is a place where people can live. Will you choose freedom without happiness? Or happiness without freedom? The only answer one can make, I think, is no.